Kiora Koto, good day everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, seminar, a uh, third one of our series. We've been running a series on, uh, on, 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 of seminars on climate change. And the series is entitled The Implications of Changes on Health Interdisciplinary Perspectives. We started with a seminar on the 13th of April, uh, which was presented by Profs uh, Arain and Sajan from McMaster University in Canada. And what they looked at basically on that seminar was how the health sector will be impacted by climate change and what actions health professionals may take to alleviate these impacts. Then about two weeks ago on the 8th of June, we had seminar two, which was presented by Associate Professor Ken Winkel from the University of Melbourne, where he spoke about interprofessional education for sustainability pathways, possibilities and experiments from Melbourne. Then today we are very delighted to be hosting uh, two presenters in the form of Prof, uh, Professor Alistair Woodward, from the University of Auckland, who will be our first speaker. And then we are going to hear from Dr. Andreas Velemsen from Lund University. The title of the talks today, uh, which is seminar three, is Pitfalls and Possibilities, Teaching Climate Change and Health. And we're going to start with Prof. Alistair. But before I hand over or introduce Alistair formally. I just want to share on the chat this thought as I always like to do. This one says tackling climate change is not a choice, it's a necessity. And this is from Anish Shah. And that's why we are running this series because our desire is that we can be able to teach our health professional students uh, the ways how do we tackle climate change and it could become part of the curriculum. So just a brief introduction of Prof. Alistair Woodward. As I said, he's from the University of Auckland. Uh, Alistair first gave his first lecture on climate change and health in 19. 93. This wasn't his idea. He was standing in for his PhD supervisor, Tony Markel, Mark Michael. Since then, he has investigated impacts, responses, and core benefits, helped write assessment reports for the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, and worked as a consultant mostly in the Pacific. He has taught short courses, long courses, online and classroom courses, and has worked with medical and health science students, public health postgrads, and mid-career health professionals. He is a public health doctor and epidemiologist. And without a doubt, I am sure that we are going to learn a lot from Alistair this uh, today. Let me say today, uh, because for some it will be evening, for some it's in the morning, uh, because he has such vast experience teaching in health. So Prof Alistair, the floor is yours. Please uh, educate us. Thank you. Uh, well, look, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, uh, I, I hope that you'll be educated, I don't know, um, but at least interested and provoked. And if there's an opportunity for discussion and for questions, then, you know, that would be great. Let me see if the system works. I'll share my screen. So, um, Yes, I suggested this title, uh, Pitfalls and Possibilities, because I think in teaching, at least it's been my experience, that um, you can make mistakes. <laughs> I've certainly made lots of mistakes. But on the other hand, you know, it is a topic, as you said, it's a necessity. We have no choice. We've got to face this and think about ways of managing it. And that involves ensuring that people are well-educated and well-informed and so on. Um, and and there are ways of doing it that uh, perhaps are, are more rewarding than others. And I just want to share some of my own experiences in these areas. But first of all, the pitfalls, I, I've thought of two of them. Um, one is complexity. Uh, 
it is a big topic with many aspects to it. And um, one of my colleagues working on the IPCC um, estimated the number of pages in the last round of the assessment reports. We were up to AR6. And he told me that there were 7,700 pages in <laughs> the reports from the IPCC, just this last round of the assessment. 7,700 pages. I couldn't sort of begin to imagine what that would be like. So I pulled books off my bookshelf and put them on the desk here, you can see, until I got to roughly 7,700. Um, you know, that that's an awful lot of pages. That's an awful lot of information that is, you know, potentially overwhelming. And, and so I think one of the challenges that we face teaching about climate change and health is, you know, how do we negotiate this complexity? How do we deal with, you know, all this information? <clears throat> the second um, uh, pitfall that I've certainly fallen into, and it's very easy to do, is to dwell on the negative aspects, um, you know, catastrophe. Uh, I don't know whether any of you saw this movie uh, the day after tomorrow. It was... Um, goodness, it's almost 20 years old, I think. Um, it was a really good disaster movie. Great, you know, special effects. Typical sort of plot, you know, that the um, the hero has to battle enormous adversity in order to rescue family members. Uh, and and the setting is a, a climate change setting. So the, the story is essentially that... Um, the the major North Atlantic currents that bring heat from the tropics up into the um, the northern part of the northern hemisphere um, stop uh, on account of climate change, a and that means that there is cooling in North America and Europe, um, and as a consequence, uh, the world is precipitated into a new ice age. Um, and that produces, you know, as you can see, this is New York, you know, in the, in the Ice Age. And you can see the figures there across this huge landscape trying to make their way. Um, now, as I said, great film um, <clears throat> and, um, and very uh, arousing and alarming. You know, um, the, the, um, the story is absolutely plausible with one factor. You know, it's highly implausible for one reason, and that is the time frame. It, it's absolutely true that the, there's some anxiety about, about the effects of ocean warming and the melting of the Greenland ice sheets on um, the North Atlantic currents, uh, which do bring heat up from the you know equ equatorial areas into the north of Europe. Um, they have in the past stopped and even reversed these currents and the effects on the climate would be significant. The thing is that this would not occur in the space of a weekend, which is the script of the plot. Um, it, they would take millennia probably to, to play out. But this is an example of climate catastrophism, you know, and I, when I got this clip, you can watch the trailer if you like. Um, on the site, on the YouTube site, somebody had put this comment that I've put down the bottom there, who would have thought that this will become a real thing in 2022? So, you know, that's where people get their information from. And it is, it's incorrect. Um, it is catastrophizing to the point of thinking, well, what's the point? You know, what, what, um, what can we do about this? You know, uh, and to overwhelm people with alarm and anxiety is a risk, you know, we, we, we have to face up to in our education. So I, I've thought about four possibilities, bearing in mind those risks that I've just described, um, that I'm going to talk about in the next 15 minutes or so. Um, seeking simple but powerful insights as a way of, you know, cutting through the complexity. Um, acknowledging anxiety, I think it's really important that we do that because that's at the heart of the sort of denialism and defeatism that can result from 
talking about climate change. Frame is opportunity as well as threat. So there's this, you know, general rule that we've got to provide rescue along with alarm. Um, and uh, I think that applies in teaching as well as in other areas. And then one thing that I've found quite helpful with my students is exploring personal agency as a starting point. It, it's not as though we're going to be able to solve climate change by individuals riding their bikes to work or turning the air conditioning down or um, having um, two meat meals a, a week instead of seven. Um, but um, as I'll explain to you, I think it is a useful starting point. It's a, it's a way of sort of um, empowering people, uh, and it's very useful in the classroom. That's my, that's my um, experience. So um, in terms of powerful, simple and powerful insights, here's um, just an example of um, the sort of challenges I like teaching in a sort of interactive to and fro way. And this is a, a very good way of testing just how good people's general knowledge is. And although climate change is something that people are often um, exposed to and they may think they know about it, they don't necessarily understand. There's no reason why they should understand, you know, the, 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 the scientific foundations of climate change. <clears throat> and so I ask the students, just imagine the Earth's atmosphere consisted solely of oxygen and nitrogen. Um, what difference would that make to the global average temperature? Uh, and so I think you can do in a big lecture theater and you get all kinds of people put their hands up on. Sometimes people are a bit shy about um, suggesting an answer. And so you can you know, encourage people to, to, to have a go. <laughs> and um, my experience is that even in postgraduate classes, many people get this wrong. I mean, the correct answer is the first one, um, the temperature of four by 30 degrees Celsius, the global average temperature. And the important thing is that we would go from a global average temperature of plus 15 to one of minus 15. In other words, the, the, the Earth would be a ball of ice. Um, and, and the reason is uh, that the greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, you know, um, keep the Earth at a temperature of plus 15 on average. And so water-based life forms have evolved. Um, and so the greenhouse effect, you know, is one of the reasons why we've got life on Earth. It's natural, it's powerful, it's incredibly important. Um, and, the, and the issue is <clears throat> the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere and the rate at which we are adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. But this is the starting point. You know, we're talking about a phenomenon that is important, it's basic. Um, and the question is, what are humans doing to, to, to affect this? A, a second example of um, simple but, but powerful insights, I think, is to challenge students. And here I'm thinking of students who typically have come through a sort of Western science background <clears throat> to think about the contribution of traditional and indigenous knowledge to um, how we manage climate change. And, and this, the, 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 the link at the bottom is a very good one, is a, an article, a popular science article, um, but again, one I'd recommend if you want to look more closely. Te Ao Māori talks about, it means the Māori point of view, Māori being the indigenous people in New Zealand. <clears throat> and that the picture is of um, one of the rivers in our South Island, typical sort of um, meandering braided river. <clears throat> And it's quite a nice image, I think, for um, approaching climate change by using a braided knowledge system, you know, weaving together different ways of thinking about the, the natural world and how we can respond. And in our particular instance, you know, flood control is a major issue, and it's something that's becoming more and more challenging with climate change. And there's a great deal that we can learn from Māori perspectives about um, how to treat, 
how to treat rivers. Uh, the, the, the colonial project really in New Zealand was the one that involved damming and restricting waterways. Uh, and that's absolutely the last thing that we should be doing in terms of thinking about flood control in an <clears throat> in age of climate change. So um, what water wants <laughs> is um, a, sort of a general principle of flood control. Think about what water wants. A and that is very much in the, um, in the center, in the mainstream of, of Māori um, teaching about um, how, how we can how we should be thinking about the environment. So that's my second example of um, what it seems to me are you know, important insights, simple but very powerful, um, and it's a way of dealing or responding to the what otherwise might be the overwhelming complexity of climate change. Now I said anxiety is something we need to acknowledge and talk about. Um, and here's a great example. This is Professor Nikki Hare, who's one of my heroes. She's a professor of psychology at the University of Auckland. Um, and this clip comes from a, a video series um, that, uh, again, I'd recommend if anybody wants to follow it up. Um, I've got a link on the right-hand side there. I'm using this this year as this, one of the core readings or core references for my postgraduate course, 10 videos about how we tackle the climate, climate crisis in, in New Zealand. A and Anxiety into Action is the title of one of these series. And it's really Nikki talking, Nikki Hare, talking about how we have to recognize anxiety um, but manage it at the same time. Uh, it is something that can spur us into action. It is also something that can absolutely undermine action. Um, and so the, the, the challenge is to find ways of um, supporting our students uh, as a consequence of you know, the threat that we face and together thinking about ways in which we can um, manage it and move forward. <clears throat> One of the things that Nikki has taught me <laughs> um, is that we've got to think about the balance of good news and bad news. And I, I asked her, what's the optimal you know, ratio of good news to bad news stories? And she said immediately, four to one, <laughs> um, that if we want people to learn, there's got to be a preponderance of good news stories. And, and one way that I've used with my students, um, be interested in where, whether others have had a similar experience, is that even in the sort of public health and science classes that I teach, people love drawing. And so you get the old fashioned big sheets of paper out and pens and give them a task like draw a resilient city. People say, oh, I can't draw, I can't draw. You say, just have a go, you know. And, and this example here, you know, this is, um, I've got this off the internet. It's not one that was presented by, produced by some of my students, but you know, they do a good job. Um, and, and it's such a great way of unlocking creativity and positivity, you know. So people typically draw trees. And so you get a chance to talk about the importance of bringing nature into the city. Um, people show lots of space for the people in the city to walk, and it's attractive. There are flowers, it's shaded, it's well lit. You know, so the, the idea of um, lively streets, of cities in which people feel safe, where people are drawn, you know, there are all kinds of things that you can pick up from this exercise. I think that's a solar panel on the right hand side, you know, so talking about renewable energy as part of climate resilience. And there's some, you know, there's all kinds of interesting thought about dispersed energy systems that are um, probably more resilient than the kind of um, reticulated, distributed systems that we have, um, centralized systems that we have at the moment. A another way of um, trying to keep that balance of four to one in mind 
um, is when we talk about the global situation, and climate change is a global problem, obviously, is just to be aware that um, the storytelling about climate change tends to very much focus on vulnerability. Um, Bangladesh is an example, you know, often brought up as a, a city, a country that is uh, extraordinarily vulnerable to storms, to flooding, um, to heat waves, to all kinds of extreme climate events. And all of that is true. <clears throat> but, but Bangladesh is also a great example of resilience. Um, the country has done some amazing things in terms of working within its limits to make um, the population safer, safer and more secure. And this picture is an interesting, is, is this picture of one of the um, innovations that uh, has been developed in Bangladesh. You can see in the background here, um, uh, floating gardens. So in Bangladesh, you know, people in the past have um, grown their food in sort of paddy fields um, in uh, its very low-lying area. So the, the gardens are frequently flooded. Um, and the problem is when there are storms, when the um, water levels are very high, then the gardens are overwhelmed. And so what they had, there, um, such a clever idea is to put these gardens into bamboo trays so they float. <laughs> um, so they go up and down with the water. Um, it's very cheap. They use local material. That's what this fellow is doing here. So just an, an example of, I, I think, emphasizing the, you know, the resourcefulness of people all around the world, including people in countries like Bangladesh. <clears throat> now, um, I, I uh, you know, academics write papers. That's what we do for our living, you know. Um, and, and I've got to say this, this is one of my favorite papers, you know, with Kirsty Wilde, who's a colleague, we wrote this by paper on the bicycle as constructive hope. And the editors of this journal have said that it is the most downloaded paper, most frequently downloaded paper that they've ever published. Um, so there's something about this story that really attracts people's interest. Um, and our argument in the, in the paper is that children are particularly prone to anxiety about the future, about what they face in the world, um, eco-anxiety, that idea. <clears throat> and so it's really important to think about ways of building what we call of constructive hope. Um, so a positive view about what might be achieved. And, and we make a case here that giving kids the example to ride bikes, to walk, to cycle, to scoot, but in here particularly we focus on the bicycle as a, an opportunity for children to have independence, to feel that they're doing something to contribute to, you know, avoiding climate change or reducing the severity of climate change. Um, all those things are really important um, in an age when children's independence and mobility is in increasingly is restricted. Um, so th there you have it. I've given you some examples of how we might be able to focus on opportunity as well as threat. A and my final point was about agency. And one of the exercises I do with my students that seems to work really well is to get them to um, estimate their own carbon footprint. And there's a host of um, of, uh, of apps that will do that or sources on the internet. This one that I'm using here, Genless, is a New Zealand um, uh, government um, carbon, cal carbon footprint calculator. It's pretty good, you know, again, give it a go if you like. And it will ask you a few simple questions and then estimate, you know, what your own carbon footprint is. <clears throat> When I first did it in 2019, I got a shock. I, I was embarrassed, you know, a and you can see why if you look, you know, the, on the right hand side compares my carbon footprint with the New Zealand average, with the global average. I, I think those numbers are actually a little bit wobbly. Um, I, I think um, 
the footprint calculator doesn't quite get it right. But the point was that um, my personal carbon footprint was way out of whack with the New Zealand average, which is on a global scale pretty high. Um, and the explanation is if you go like across to the left hand side, um, the amount of air travel I was doing. Um, and um, most of that was work, work related. So here I'm in the embarrassing situation of being a public health doctor, particularly interested in the environment, um, close interest in climate change, with this enormous car you know, carbon footprint as a consequence of my long distance um, flying. Um, and uh, I was sort of conscious that it was probably an issue, but didn't appreciate just how big an issue it was until you know, I did this exercise. <clears throat> so I think um, it, it does bring home to people at a personal level, you know, what the, uh, what the implications are and where there may be opportunities. You know, in my case, of course, you all know what happened in 2020, you know, <laughs> uh, long distance aviation vanished, um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't anything to do with climate change. It was COVID-related. Um, but uh, it, it remains a project of mine, you know, to shrink that pie um, and to, to have a, a more reasonable and sustainable um, pattern of behavior. And the same happens with food, with energy use, um, uh, with other aspects of living that people can relate to, I think. Um, and um, it's a great starting point for discussion. So um, just to sum up, um, teaching about climate change, I do think there are some risks we've got to be aware of, you know, the sort of overwhelming people with detail um, on the one hand, and then frightening people silly on the other, so that they go away with the message that, um, you know, the world's about to fall over the edge of a cliff, uh, and it's not absolutely clear what we can do about it. I think we've got to manage both those potential pitfalls. And, and here are some examples um, of how we might do it. I, I'm going to stop there because I, I hope there will be an opportunity to hear a bit from <laughs> those who are on the call. Um, and uh, I'd be um, very happy at a later stage to respond if people want to email me with their, you know, follow up, follow up uh, ideas. So thank you. Thanks, Alistair, for that uh, quite an interesting and intriguing presentation. And uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm just happy that that question uh, that you normally ask your students uh, about uh, if we just had oxygen and nitrogen, what will the temperature be? I'm happy that you didn't ask us to respond to that question <laughs> because we would have definitely been exposed. Maybe if I may just add as well that uh, one of the things, and this links to part of your presentation, as you talk about our own anxieties, uh, the pitfalls of complexity, looking at this as a catastrophe. When we started this series, one of the things that we said to ourselves was that we actually don't know what we need to know. It's important that we educate ourselves. So for the past five, six months, we've been trying to educate ourselves either through this series, uh, seminar series, or other resources that we've shared with each other. And our desire is that uh, with a bigger group of the U21 Health Sciences, we'll be able to put together resources that people can be able to use. So I think your presentation has aligned very well with our thinking and where we need to be. And the way that you summarize those possibilities is quite useful for us. So thank you very much for your presentation. I think we have about five minutes that we can maybe interact on. Uh, and then at about 20 to 19 minutes to 12 on my clock, we can maybe start playing the video from Andreas. Colleagues, do you have any qu quick questions or comments for Alistair? I do. Can I jump in, Sibyl? Yes. 
Thank you, Alistair. That was such a good presentation and I love the key messages that you were able to highlight. Picking up exactly on what Sibu was saying, I, I do not feel like I know the content to be able to deliver. So your, your point about the 7,700 pages of content being overwhelming is really resonates. And, and I think when we went into this, as Sibu was saying, we we knew how we could do IPE for research. We knew how we could do it for, say, communication, all these other things. But I would have no knowledge of where to start to develop up IPE in this space. Realistically, because I'm from the University of Melbourne, I'm in nursing, um, and while we'd love to do an IPE type um, uh, initiative, if I think about it just in nursing for now, it that climate change sustainability would be woven into case studies. There might be a workshop on it. There might be this. So to get, it's not like we have a dedicated subject to it or a course to it. That knowledge, therefore, for the academics to be able to feel confident and to know what the key messages are, I think is one of the biggest challenges of being able to really start the steps that can grow that real focus on climate change. I would love to know your thoughts or suggestions to be able to enable that and support that process. What you've found being, being that knowledge expert in your space and supporting the other disciplines to, to be able to take those steps so that it does have a real, um, it is centre, centre the screen. Yeah. Oh, look, thank you for the for your comment and observation. It sort of certainly rings true for me. Um, uh, I think context and sort of positionality are all important. You know, if you're working in a nursing school um, in Melbourne, then think about the the case studies that most resonate with you. You know, and I, I I'm thinking of the you know, the dreadful bushfires that you've had in the southeast of Australia, which are very much climate related, um, and the consequences for the health system. Um, you know, how, how do you prepare an Australian healthcare system that's going to manage the, the wildfire risk, um, manage the mental health problems associated with drought? Um, you know, there, there are a few key things that uh, Australia, you know, almost above any other country is at particular risk of. Um, and uh, the the contribution from nurses and other healthcare providers is going to be so important in terms of, you know, being prepared for those things and, and able to respond. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I think about the asthma storms as well. That drawing upon that local context, um, we can leverage through that. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Have you seen the? Have Have you experienced an interest or growth in how climate change is presented across the different disciplines? Yes. Yes. A and I mean, an another thought. I didn't have time to talk about it today is the very interesting that work that's being done, I know, looking at competencies for sustainability. What, what are the core competencies for sustainability um, in, in terms of what we need to be able to equip students with? And this obviously reaches right across the disciplines. Um, oh, one of the competencies, of course, is to be able to work together with people from other disciplines, you know, um, that, that that sort of is a, a starting point for interprofessional or transdisciplinary education. Um, so that's another suggestion. I know here Nikki Hare and Charlotte Blythe are the two people who are um, writing about this in a very interesting way, um, and, and I see that as a, a maybe a helpful resource also. Thank you. That is a very interesting one, the competencies for sustainability. And I see, Shan, that you are vigorously noting that down. I think it's quite an important aspect that uh, will assist us as we try and navigate 
this space. Sarah, were you putting your camera on because you have a question or you were just putting it on? Well, actually, it was more of a, an agreement and finally being in a space where I could put the camera on as I was in transit. So thank you, Dr. Okay. Wilbur. That was very, very uh, uh, enlightening. And, and I agree with Sharon, the idea of competency for climate change in health professions could be a very exciting, but also helpful pathway forward. So thank you for that. Right, right. Okay, Alisa, thank you very much for, for, for engaging us with your presentation. And uh, I truly liked it because it presented a succinct message, very straightforward, uh, not overwhelming information, but very clear examples of what can be done and what can be considered uh, as part of those pitfalls and as also as part of those possibilities that we need to look at. So thank you very much for uh, giving the talk to us. As we say,